from the 37th parallel on America's haunted highway, it's Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange. What's up, everybody, and welcome back. You're listening to Pixelated Paranormal. This is episode 132. Woo-hoo. And it's a special episode, not just because of the topic, but because Steven's back. Hello. I'm back. <laughs> yeah, we got the band back together for this one. Uh, and I think we had to because just like our slogan says in the intro, we are all about the unusual and the strange. And this story is exactly that. Awesome. Yep. And I Can't think wait. there needs to be a special episode where we sit down with Preston's dad and get him on the microphone. <laughs> For real, though. Yeah. Because, like, not only, like, to have to have that on, you know, like, on a permanent file that you can listen to later, oh, on, yeah. later on in life, like, that's, like, a really big deal. I know my buddy Mike, who has been podcasting for years, he doesn't anymore, but, like, that was really important for him is to catalog that period of his life, especially the time of, like, his daughter, you know, being conceived and then born. Yeah. And then also getting his family on there. So in the case of anything huh. happening, you can always look back on them episodes. So I think with your dad's with your dad's experience of some of that shit, that'd be tight to get on get on audio for you, man. Yeah, I'd be down for that. It'd be tight. But would he be Say that again without a mouthful of vape. <laughs> but <laughs> God, I hate you. <laughs> but he can't help it. But you would, can't fucking put it down for like 20 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> the more important question is, would your dad Would your dad be down for that? I think so. Okay. Because you know what? I mean, I don't want to make him gotta uncomfortable. Get the Chiefs, we just got to get the Chiefs to another Super Bowl so he's in a good mood. So. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> I feel like the most important question is, would your dad feel like recording with you for half an hour in a room full of fucking strawberry bubblegum cotton candy vape? <laughs> Yeah, he doesn't care. I'm joking God. about <laughs> Yeah, He survived shit. the war to come home to vape. <laughs> the man who's yeah. impervious to being killed, the man who should have died 16 times goes out because you fucking smoke him out. You suffocate him with fucking jelly beans and Captain fucking Crunch. Vape, the vape clouds, bro. <laughs> That's vape sesh. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, hey, speaking of your dad, um, I happened to run into a guy that I've known for a couple of years now who was in the war, and he works security in Old Town now. And the dude's yep. just like your dad, just a, a lot of really great stories. And so I asked him, I was like, hey, you know what? Um, you know, my, my buddy was talking to his father the other day about being a tunnel rat in Vietnam. And, you know, I asked him, I was like, did you ever hear any old rumors of the rock apes? And he kind of looked at me kind of funny and rolled his eyes. And I was what like, you know? well, yeah, like the little like jungle Bigfoots. <laughs> and he's like, no, not really. But he's like, I was a tunnel rat too. And this guy's about probably three inches shorter than I am. His chest is built like a barrel. And I can just imagine him like throwing Volkswagens for hobbies. <laughs> but he said he was a tunnel rat as well. And he told me, he's like, man, beyond those kiss your ass snakes, you had to watch out for fucking cobras. <laughs> and I said, Cobras? And he's like, yeah, he's like a little booby trap that the Viet Cong used to do is in their tunnels, they used to tie up Cobras with vines and twine in random spots in those tunnels. So whenever the Americans would go chasing after them, they get attacked by Cobras. Oh, my God. That's and so, so his special job as a tunnel rat, he had to go through the tunnels with a flamethrower. Oh, shit. Wow. And he said, basically, like, every three to four feet, you just tap the trigger and blow out a, you know, a puff of uh, fire and then crawl through the charred remains of multiple different snakes and stuff like that. They'd tie up in those tunnels. Dude, that's giving me anxiety listening to that story. That's, right? that's what I'm saying. I want to I want to have your dad on here listen to some stories. Like, and it might not tie to paranormal shit. Like, I mean, even if we do that just for just for us, I just I would love that, yeah. man. I, love I mean, oh, giant I was, snakes and glow, or giant uh, glow in the dark snakes and spiders. That's uh, pretty unusual and strange. Yeah, so. <laughs> that's true. Well, just <laughs> to hear your dad. Just, oh God! Can we just call it Big John Wiener, the man who couldn't be killed? Yeah, <laughs> got shot in the head. Your brother tried to kill him with bee stings. Just and ran him over with the three wheeler. <laughs> yeah, man, just won't quit. <laughs> no shit. 
Well, uh, the topic tonight has to do with alien abductions. But first, I think we ought to hit some news because we've got some space related news coming up. So, Preston, why don't you get us started with that? So the uh, first article that I want to bring up is uh, titled Radio Signals Hit Earth Every 16 Days from 5 Million Light Years Away. So that's right. That moment in contact with Jodie Foster is finally happening. What? Scientists are baffled by a mysterious object 500 million light years away that is transmitting signals that hit Earth every 16 days. Although scientists do not know what is causing the phenomenon, they are recognizing it as the first reliable pattern of fast radio bursts in deep space. Such signals have been a source of confusion for scientists since they were first discovered in 2007, and as up until now, none of the fast radio bursts studies have exhibited any sort of steady tempo. So they've been kind of sporadic and all over the place. However, this new phenomenon changes all of that as it emits a specific pattern, blasting uh, out around one to two radio bursts per hour for four days, then goes silent for 12 days, then the cycle repeats for the 16th day, suggesting something is controlling them. And do you think scientists are going to admit that it's aliens? Ooh, probably not. The the answer is no, they're not. They're like, <laughs> well, it could be because it's a big interstellar object that's being blocked by a... St- Fuck you, scientists. It's aliens. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Easy to Fuck Trump. you. <laughs> yeah. And that's not the first recent time we've heard about these strange radio waves hitting the Earth as well. So it's kind of starting to be a little more of a coincidence. It is like that yeah. movie Contact. Yeah, they were uh, they were saying that uh, because it was uh, you, you know short burst every couple of hours for yeah. like sixteen days that if it was an intelligent species they'd have a, a more complex pattern for more amount of time. I'm like, you ever thought that maybe they look at Earth and they're like, dude, those guys are a bunch of fucking retards. Like we can't do anything complex, so let's just do a couple little bursts for a couple hours. You know, do it every twelve days, and they'll figure out that it's aliens. But then we're like, nope. It's a they're, sun. They're actually trying to go around us. <laughs> like yeah. to go further. <laughs> <laughs> like something out of a Mel Brooks movie. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> right. Slingshot past us. Yeah. Well, Presto, I'm going to interject the next news story because mine is short and sweet. But uh, Shayla sent us an actual article back on the 3rd of February titled Commercial Pilot Films UFO Flying Near Airplane. And as we all know, you know, airplane pilots see a ton of weird stuff flying around, but a lot of times that weird stuff happens inside the plane. Well, a gentleman by the name of Caesar or Cesar flying the Airbus A320 for Viva Air, which is a low-cost Colombian airline, filmed a strange cube-shaped craft flying next to their airplane and shared it worldwide on his TikTok. It shows a metallic cube that seems to be moving at a high rate of speed, even though it doesn't have any noticeable wings, tail, or exhaust plume. And you can watch the video there. It's on YouTube. Um, I don't know. I'm going to lean towards hot air balloon. But it is pretty interesting nonetheless. Yeah. Need to check it out. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll tag everybody in it again or reshare it on the Facebook page. But and it's a short and sweet video. It's nothing too crazy. It just shows this thing kind of rotating as it's flying through the uh, clouds. But hmm. interesting nonetheless. Creepy. Huh? All right, Presto, what do you got? Well, say it loud. Say it proud. Say it three times fast. Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. <laughs> Beetle guys. Beetlejuice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> originally the Beetlejuice <laughs> character was spelled the same way as Beetle Guy. So, and since this is a paranormal podcast, we're going with Beetlejuice, which is a huge red star <laughs> in the Orion constellation that makes up part of his belt. And it may explode soon. And the next few weeks are critical. The super giant has been getting dimmer at an unprecedented pace over the past few months leading some astronomers to wonder if it might be in the process of the collapse that precedes a supernova explosion. But there are other possible explanations, so again, fuck you, science. 
and we should have a better <laughs> idea of what's happening to the massive star by the end of the month. It is well known that Beetlejuice has no more than a of a hundred thousand years left to burn and can start its death throes just about any time between now and then. When it does go supernova, it's expected to result in a dramatic light show that could be visible in daylight and appear brighter than the full moon for a few weeks. The last time humans <laughs> wow. experienced this was in the 17th century. That'd so. be crazy. Yeah. Uh, so wh- yeah. so it's, why is its name Beetlejuice? It's weird. Um, it has a Greek mythology. There was like some demon that was named Beetle, Geis, Beetlejuice, what the fuck ever. <laughs> and uh, because it's a big, giant red sun, you know, demons are red. Um, you know, put two and two together. There you go, buddy. You're, yeah, su- you're such said. a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me push up my glasses. <laughs> I didn't mean to hit Muse, but that's a really funny uh, coincidence. The joke I was going to make is that uh, basically every one of Muse's songs is about to come true with a super massive black hole and a supernova and mm. time's running out. <laughs> and apparently, my phone read my mind and started playing Uprising by Muse. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> well, I don't know. That could be super, super interesting to see. And like Rob had said, a once in a lifetime chance that we might actually get to see during our time. Yeah. God, that'd be scary. Yeah, it Imagine really would, man. Because because people, people would not people would not. You know how depressing it. that would be, though. The like Orion's belt, you know, loses a loop in your lifetime. Like, how many times have you looked up to the stars at night yeah. and recognized that constellation because of its belt? And then all or just to have it have it light everywhere for a, how many yeah. months? Two months? Um, it said like three to four weeks. That mm-hmm. that's crazy. That'll fucking people will go ape shit. Yeah, you'll have you'll have <laughs> fucking pandemonium. I'm some dead serious. Like no, that shit, you're you're right. That shit in Alaska. Rock. Yeah, when that ah. shit happens in Alaska, like people act differently. There's all fucking documentaries on it, man. The human brain yeah. just you can't comprehend. Uh, it's well, fucking, it wouldn't be bright like the daytime. It'd be about as bright as a full moon out. Oh, okay. I thought you meant like constant fucking light. I was like, holy Christ, shit, dude. No. <laughs> That'd be I terrible. think scientists would be making a bit bigger deal than that. Like yeah. all your nocturnal animals would start to suffer. <laughs> I was just saying that the event's going to be so bright that you can see it during the daytime. Oh, like, okay. You know how when you wake up in the morning and you can still see a full moon? Yeah. Like it's going to be like that. But Like the other night, the there weeks. was a full, beautiful full moon and there was like a lot of like clouds and fog. So it was bright as shit, man. That mm-hmm. was really cool. There was a day a couple years ago back when I used to have to drive to Winfield when it was uber foggy out to where everything looked black and white. And the sun was barely shining behind the fog and the clouds and it looked like it was straight out of the twilight zone. It was really wicked. It was tight. But you also couldn't see more than about uh, three feet in front of your car. So it was also really scary. You're like, hell to the no. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I think, guys, to quote my favorite Canadian TV show, let's not waste any more time. Pitter-patter, let's get at her. So on tonight's episode, I (laughs) thought we'd share one of the more bizarre cases of alien abduction to ever be written or talked about. A famous case known as the Manhattan Transfer. Now, I grew up reading about this book. Um, It was in my little favorite book, World's Best True UFO Stories. And it fascinated me ever since, like, the fifth grade. But have either of you guys ever read about this or heard about this at all? No, I have not. Nope. Neither one of you. Okay, cool. Preston, you may recognize it as we kind of get into it. But what's really interesting about this story is, like I said, I read about this thing back in the fifth grade. But apparently they didn't include the entire story in this kid's book. And the rest of the story I didn't know is absolutely fucking bonkers. So let's just start off, shall we? So in most cases of supposed alien abduction, we always kind of know the victims are always whisked away from their homes in sparsely populated cities or towns or countrysides. Oftentimes the phenomenon is said to happen in small neighborhoods, wooded areas, farms, camping trips, fishing trips, cabins, and etc., 
Well, tonight's case is much different because it took place right in the center of New York City in Manhattan. So far, far away from the usual desolate roads or countryside cabins. Now, the story begins on November 30th, 1989, with a 41-year-old woman named Linda Cortile, now known as Linda Napolitano. Linda lived with her husband. (laughs) Right? That's what I thought, too, Napoleon. (laughs) Neapolitan, rather. So Linda lived with her husband and her kids in an apartment in downtown Manhattan in the state of New York. Early on the morning of the 30th of November... Linda woke up in her bedroom to a truly startling discovery. Standing at the foot of her bed, to her astonishment and horror, there was a strange, slender humanoid figure standing just inside the shadows shrouded in darkness. The creature had a larger-than-normal head with what she believed to be large, oval-shaped eyes that were obscured in the darkness. So in that moment, Linda's mind immediately started racing. Who is that? What is that? How did it get in here? I know I locked the apartment door. Where's my husband? And she felt this familiarity about this shadowy (laughs) silhouette and then immediately felt terror. She tried to pick up her pillow to throw it at the thing at the foot of the bed in the shadows, but it felt oddly heavy and her body was beginning to grow very weak. So the pillow simply dropped out of her hands and fell to the floor. And then she herself fell limp across her bed and laid next to her husband. Ugh. Yeah. And like in most abduction cases, Linda's husband was actually laying right next to her, but he was just dead asleep, completely immune to what was going on in their bedroom at that moment. And he himself has no recollection of what happened to his wife next. Linda says that the entity was joined by two others, together three creatures in total. They got her out of the bed and then floated her just off the surface of the floor and almost willed her into a fetal position. Then she just kind of started floating across the bedroom floor and they floated her right out the window into a saucer-shaped craft that was waiting outside, suspended in midair outside of their apartment 12 stories above the street below. Then after that, she remembers nothing. She awoke the next morning without any real memory of the encounter, just oddly groggy, but otherwise fine. Except she had the strangest fragmented dream from the night before. Now, Linda would go on from that morning to assume that what little she could remember was just a bad dream, but with little pieces of foggy memories popping up here and there. And then slowly, she soon began to believe this might not be just a dream after all and believed in the possibility it was something much more terrifying that had occurred to her. While dealing with the rabbit hole that this kind of experience could present, Linda tried to convince herself that she was just overreacting to a bad dream. But one day, she happened to come across a book with a particularly startling creature on the cover that caused her to pause and take notice. The book was called... Intruders, The Incredible Visitations at Copley Woods, written by seasoned UFO researcher Bud Hopkins, which is a book that he had written about an alien abduction that had taken place just a few years before that in 1983 in Indiana. Now, after seeing the cover for Bud Hopkins' Intruders book, Linda had become both convinced and worried that something similar had happened to her that night in her apartment. So, she reached out to Bud Hopkins to see if he could help her figure out just what the mystery was. And as you can see, that copy of Intruders does have your classic gray alien on the cover of it. Mm-hmm. Which is a pretty startling you know, image just to come across and really jar your memory. Do you have this book? I do. Actually, the photo I included in the Google Doc is the cover of the copy I have. Nope. And uh, we will definitely have to get into that story later on because I actually thought that book was about something entirely different. And then I read the synopsis and I'm like, holy crap, that sounds outstanding. And we haven't really talked in depth about Whitley Strieber's communion, which is a story I hope we can get into sometime soon, but something similar to Linda's reaction with Hopkins's book happened to Whitley Strieber when he released communion, which documented his personal abduction story from the cabin he had in upstate New York. 
And on the cover of that has a very classic gray alien painting, which a lot of people were just jarred right out of their afternoon routines when they would see that on bookshelves. Mm-hmm. People actually were so enthralled by the image on the cover of this book, they began writing in uh, letters to Whitley talking about similar memories of entities they had encountered as well. And they received so many letters, he actually compiled that into a book called The Communion Letters. Now, and I had that book as well. I just recently um, – I linked in the group chat. We had a, a Kindle credit of like $5 that are mm-hmm, – was it mm-hmm. $10? Was it 5 10 bucks, $10? yeah. Yeah, $10. Given to uh, select the Amazon accounts, and pretty much everybody clicked on it would get it. And uh, so I bought. I was looking for this book to get mm-hmm. uh, the communion, but it's not available on Kindle. And then I was Weird. like, okay, I want to look up the communion letters. That wasn't on there either. At least I couldn't find it on on, on my Kindle. I'm no, pissed. I had I had looked for it on uh, Apple Books and also on Kindle and couldn't find it either. Yeah. That's just weird. I thought everything was available like that. Yeah. I, guess I think everything to a point, but a lot of your books by like, you know, supposed uh, abductees and paranormal research and stuff, a lot of times those people want those physical books on shelves or they want to create a sense of urgency and actually, you know, stop printing them. Like this copy yeah. of Communion I picked up the other day at Half Price Books, it's a first edition hardback, which is the one I desperately wanted. So, um, Sometimes they're a little more rare to find. You hear that, everybody? He's flexing. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, here's the uh, the burden I have to carry now. My paperback copy I read while we were on the cruise a couple of summers ago, I highlighted the crap out of that book for when we do actually cover it. Mm-hmm. So now i got to go through and highlight everything <laughs> in oh, the shit. new book. Yeah. So, yeah. Hey, right. That'll be me. fun, though, because then you'll yeah. reread it. You know. Well, yeah. I was thinking I really got to have an excuse to go back through this thing because it's been long enough now since I read it. I don't remember every little detail I wanted to talk about. So, But, yeah, you can get a paperback copy of that for pretty cheap. Sweet. Or just borrow my copy. I'm going to give this paperback to Preston. I promised it to Preston already, but you guys can share that. Hell yeah, dude. Well, after receiving Linda's request to meet and discuss her experience, Hopkins turned out to be very interested in her story. And since she could only remember scattered pieces of the event, he arranged for her to undergo hypnotic regression to try and see what possibly is hiding under the surface of those memories. Once she was put under the hypnosis, here's how she describes the initial experience in her bedroom in her own words. I'm standing up on nothing. They take me out all the way up, way above the building. Oh, I hope I don't fall. The UFO opens up like a clam, and I'm inside. I see benches, similar to regular benches, and they're bringing me down a hallway. Doors open like sliding doors, and inside are all these lights and buttons and a big long table. I don't want to get up on that table. They get me on the table anyway. They start saying things to me, and I'm yelling. I can still yell. And one of them says something that sounds like knobby egg. I think they're trying to get me to be quiet, because then he puts his hand over my mouth. The creatures were no more than four feet tall, and their heads. Their heads were so funny, almost too big for their frail little bodies, like they could almost fall off at any minute. They begin to do an examination and experiments on me, and I remember their eyes. Those eyes were so black dark and empty and cold they looked at me like the way scientists look at lab rats then before she knew it she was in her bedroom again lying on her bed with her stomach full of fear and angst she rolled over completely drained of all her energy to look and see if her husband was still there but try as she might she could not wake him so she thought that he might have been dead She got up and stumbled to their children's room in fear that her kids were dead too, only to find them lifeless and unresponsive. So at the last little bit of her strength, she took a small makeup mirror and held it in front of her children's mouths, and she could see the slight fog from their breath steaming up the mirror. So relieved, she ran back to the bedroom and did the same thing to her husband and found him to be the same way, alive and breathing, but dead to the world. So now we have a taste of just what exactly happened to Linda that night. 
And as if this wasn't terrifying enough, her life was about to get even stranger. So, Preston, do you have any recollection yet of this story? No, not at all. Wow. Okay, perfect. Great. So you don't have any idea what's about to happen. (laughs) I have no fucking clue. (laughs) Well, by now, Hopkins is knee deep in this case, trying to find out what exactly had happened to Linda. When out of seemingly nowhere, he receives a letter in the mail from two additional witnesses from that night calling themselves Richard and Dan. Richard and Dan were two New York police officers who claimed that they saw the entire encounter involving Linda from across the river from a nearby bridge. They said that after she disappeared into that craft, it flew away, and they sat there in disbelief for 45 minutes, just praying she would return safely. So just as soon as Hopkins feels like he's finally got a break in the case, he receives another communication from Dan and Richard. And mind you guys, he hasn't gone public with this case yet. Not a lot of people realize he's researching this. Just a few tight-knit people in a circle, and then maybe whoever else that Linda may have told. Here's where things get a little weird. This new letter reveals that Dan and Richard are not actually police officers, but instead, they're actually both bodyguards that had been inside a motorcade job escorting a United Nations Secretary General inside of a limo that night, and they claimed they would have been traveling over the Brooklyn Bridge when suddenly the vehicle had stopped in a thick gridlock of unexplained traffic. And while they were stalled out, they spotted a large, disc-shaped craft hovering outside of Linda's apartment. And then in addition to the UFO, they even claimed to have seen the body of a woman levitate up towards it, along (laughs) with some other non-human beings of some sort, who all entered the craft. And then the strange ship shot down and plunged into the East River near Pier 17. All of this had been apparently witnessed by them and also the diplomat they had been riding with. What about all the other people in the traffic jam? Right. Well, we'll get to that in a little bit. That's what makes this case even more interesting than most cases. So here's what Richard describes they saw. There was an oval-shaped object hovering over the top of the apartment building two or three blocks from where we sat. We didn't know where it came from. It happened too fast. Its lights turned into a bright reddish-orange to a whitish-blue hue coming out of the bottom. Green lights rotated around the edge of the saucer. A little girl or woman of the sort, wearing a white gown, sailed out of the window in the fetal position and then stood in midair in this beam of light. I could see three of the ugliest creatures I ever saw. From that far away, really? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know what they were. They weren't human. Their heads were out of proportion. Very large heads with no hair. Those buggers were escorting her into the craft. My partner screamed, We gotta get them. When we tried to get out of the car, we couldn't. After the woman was inside, the oval turned reddish orange again and whisked off. So even with their powerful government jobs and the positions they had of high clearance and the countless years upon years of high-pressure training for the job these two supposedly had being a government bodyguard, nothing would in any way prepare them to witness the bizarre and unexplainable event they had saw that night. So as later explained by Richard, the experience had left them both in an unparalleled state of shock and high anxiety. And imagine being in that position like, You're in the big time. You're riding in limos. You're escorting, you know, diplomats and high level members of, you know, the U.S. government. And all of a sudden you have to come out and say, oh, by the way, guys, I saw a UFO and a little green man float a woman out of a building 12 stories above a busy street. You're fine. You'd be laughed. (laughs) Right. You'd be laughed all the way down to the unemployment office. So now all three participants in the Manhattan abduction were having to learn how to deal with what exactly they witnessed or were involved in that early morning, whether they had experienced it or simply witnessed it. And little did they know the experience was far from over and Linda was about to experience her second abduction. While Linda may have been the one to get taken aboard the alien saucer, Richard and Dan were also trying to come to grips with what they think they saw. They'd become irrational and psychotic, feeling extreme waves of paranoia and fear, 
and Dan actually started to become very obsessed with the idea that Linda actually had some unusual, extraordinary secret <laughs> power or psychic ability to manipulate other people's perception of reality, and that maybe she had somehow created the entire experience as some sort of supernatural hallucination. Lost now, according to Richard, what's that? He's lost his mind. He's like right. trying to, his brain's trying to picture, put together what he saw. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, because again, in that position, I think you have to err on the side of being very cynical. Yeah. And no, there's no little green man. There's no alien. Like, what is this witch woman doing? Yeah. So according to Richard, after they filed their statement with Bud Hopkins, the two bodyguards had actually begun to stalk Linda, <laughs> following her around day and night, and essentially becoming completely obsessed with her and her every move. And then on the afternoon of April 29th, 1991, Dan and Richard actually followed Linda as she made her daily run of errands, pulled up beside her on the street, and threw her in the back of a big white van Holy that they shit. had rented. And proceeded to drive around New York, grilling her on what exactly they had seen that morning and how she had managed to fake such a bizarre stage show. They let her go after about three hours of interrogation, and she immediately contacted Hopkins to tell him exactly what had just happened. But even after their three-hour interrogation, Dan still wasn't quite satisfied with Linda's answers. So not too long after the whole van episode, Dan took it upon himself once again, to get more information. So one afternoon, about six months after the original kidnapping, he once again proceeded to stalk Linda for a few hours, and then just when she was alone for one brief moment, he was able to kidnap her again, this time taking her to a warehouse that he called a safe house, where he began to where he proceeded to actually accuse her of being a part of the alien secret agenda and blamed her for getting them involved in the whole experience, saying this, that she tar... <laughs> this <laughs> poor what? bastard. Yeah. It ate his mind apart when he saw something he couldn't explain. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So sad. He says that she was involved in the experience and that she targeted those two men specifically. Linda says that while Dan was going on about this big conspiracy involving her and these space aliens... She looked around and happened to notice what she describes as manila folders laying around on various desks throughout the room. She thought they might be CIA files. Then things took a huge left turn when Dan became very agitated and demanded that Linda remove all her clothing and put on a white nightgown that was similar to the one that she had worn that night during the abduction. At this point, Linda panicked, knocked over Dan, and ran as fast as she could, busting out the unlocked door of the building that Dan had been keeping her in. And she managed to get a few hundred feet down the shoreline when she says that Dan tackled her and began yelling gibberish at her while he proceeded to dunk her head in and out of the beach water. Luckily for her, nearby people had noticed the commotion and Richard himself arrived at the scene just in time to subdue Dan, who then released Linda, allowing her to get away and disappear from the two men, marking the last time she would ever physically see Dan or Richard face to face, although she claims they did continue to follow her from time to time. And she also claimed that she received correspondence from Richard around a month after the second kidnapping. He informed her then that Dan was dangerously obsessed with her, and he was now in a mental facility. And Hopkins didn't meet them directly either, but Linda's husband, son, and a friend of Linda's did vouch for Dan and Richard's existence by saying they had all met them before. Now in the meantime, another witness to the event came forward, a woman named Janet Kimball. Janet said that her car had broken down around the same time near the bridge as the abduction that evening and she had noticed what she described as a large metallic saucer-shaped object hovering near the apartment buildings. But she had originally just brushed it off and assumed it had just been a movie set of some science fiction movie being filmed in the area. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, the 80s. <laughs> yeah. So by now, Hopkins had begun doing some deep dives into just who exactly Dan and Richard were, and after researching the motorcade escorts that were supposedly in the area that fateful morning, 
he discovered there was indeed an actual escort traveling over the bridge late that night for a U.S. United Nations Secretary General, Javier Perez de Cuillar. Hopkins allegedly was able to reach out to Javier, but the diplomat declined making any official public statements, saying that while he understood the importance of his official eyewitness testimony and how it would help Hopkins' case, it would also undoubtedly ruin his career and his credibility. So, he declined to make an official statement on the matter, but he supposedly did say off the record that he was in a motorcade on that bridge late that night with his two bodyguards in his limo. Hopkins tried the best he could, again elaborating just how huge and important this would be if Javier could come forward with his testimony. But Javier refused, saying that if his name got brought up in the incident, he'd simply deny knowing anything about the event or ever speaking to Hopkins. Now, you asked earlier about witnesses, and there are a few more witnesses in the area that did come forward. Years later, around the year 2000, an interesting witness ended up coming forward named Yancey Spence. Spence claims that he was a New York Post journalist at the time and had been in his office right across the street on the night of the abduction. And from his office, he says that he saw the entire episode with Linda as it unraveled and claimed that along with her, several other people were supposedly taken that night by these strange entities. This is supposedly documented in a magazine article titled The Day Manhattan Stood Still, where he would recall being in the offices of the New York Post building and claimed that there were more people in his office to witness Linda's abduction, and he would also put forward his belief of the abduction of several of his fellow journalists that evening as well. And so now to wrap things up in an epilogue. In a recent 2003 French magazine interview for La Gazette Fortiane, or Fortiani, meaning the magazine of the Fortian, in issue number two, Linda gives some new facts about her case and mentions a new witness, who was a New York Post truck driver, who says that he saw the abduction from the Brooklyn Bridge, but Linda withholds his name. There are a few more rumors of the abduction causing a small traffic jam on the intersection between South Street and Catherine Slip, with another anonymous witness who saw the stopped traffic at approximately the same time as the abduction. The witness says that he is a well-known New York Post journalist who wishes to remain anonymous, who was at the New York Post complex's bar the night of the incident. He said that he was too drunk to drive home that night, So he asked one of the post truck drivers if they could drop him off at his house. The truck driver answered that the delivery truck can't move because there are several limos blocking the street in a traffic jam. He even suspected that the big boss might be paying a visit to the newspaper, which would explain why there were so many limos. So he supposed that the lead limo in the traffic jam after all these years was the one carrying Dan, Richard, and Javier. Now, other people have argued that they were unloading trucks at farther piers down the the river, and they didn't see anything. So you've got a pretty decent mix of skeptics and actual people who believe in this event, and it's about a 50-50. People who have said they saw it versus people who said they were in the area and didn't notice a single thing. But that is the story of the Manhattan Transfer. So, in my children's book, The World's Best True UFO Stories, it only mentions briefly about her being taken out of the bed, you know, her bedroom, coming back, checking on the children, reaching out to Hopkins, and to police officers who were supposedly the witnesses. I read about four or five different articles to get all this information, and I had no idea about the kidnappings, um, you know, the beachside drowning, all that kind of crap. Yeah, that's good. That got, I'm just that got like, creepy. Well, really it cool. went from like close encounters to like a buddy cop movie <laughs> real quick. Yeah, like what the fuck? Yeah, it's it's a, a case that has stayed with me for so many years. And then to learn that other side of that story is just pretty interesting. It is pretty interesting. Well, with all that, I think it's a good place to stop for this episode. I don't think we could really shoehorn anything else into that, but I've got a lot of these classic UFO cases I want to go into in this book and then research, like, you know, the parts they left out of the kids' stories. 
and see what else we can get into along with communion and also the intruders. So I think we got a lot more really great abduction cases and I kind of researched a little bit. I couldn't find any more of what she recalls happening. Although a few uh, websites and stories have said that she came forward later saying it wasn't the first time she'd been abducted, that she actually remembers being taken as a child as well. And then being involved in the supposed alien human hybrid cloning and all that kind of stuff. So who knows? But yeah, that's the story of the N Manhattan transfer. All right, Steve, what do you want to plug? Let's get on up out of here. <clears throat> cool. Check us out on Facebook, Pixelated Paranormal Podcast. Check us out on Instagram, PXL Paranormal, where you can see all the pictures we post and stuff like that. And you can check out our horror podcast, 13 Nightmares. We are mm-hmm. at 13 Nightmares Pod. Is that the thing? Yep, on the Instagram. Uh-huh. Yeah, yep. And then uh, also 13 Nightmares Podcast on Facebook Hell for all that. Yeah. And that's a horror podcast where we cover a horror movie a time. And pretty awesome. The Return of the Living Dead is our first movie, and it's gotten a lot of positive response. Thanks it to really all has. the listeners out there. I appreciate it. Yeah, most definitely. Oh, yeah. You know, real quick, speaking of horror movies, you know what I, f- I find to be the most underrated horror sci-fi movie of the 90s? What's that? What? Predator 2. Because it gave us the classic line of, it's your move, pussy face. And it's just <laughs> it's by far the one of the best Predator. Uh, is that a phrase you tend to use quite a bit now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's your move, pussy face. <laughs> oh, my God. No, that movie was actually pretty damn good. That's the one where that takes place, like, with Danny Glover, right? Yeah, Danny Glover yeah. and uh, Gary Busey. Yep. In the, in yep. the city, right? Uh-huh. In the city. Yeah. That's awesome. Silly. Yeah. I should probably <laughs> give that one another watch sometime soon. So yeah. cool. And guys, we also have a Patreon set up through the Pixelated Sausage Network page. If you want to drop by and throw a couple bucks in the tip jar, so to speak, we'd be awfully, awfully thankful for that. Let's see what else we got. Check out Mark's solo show, Pixelated Sausage. Check out his Attack the Backlog. Steven, you already mentioned 13 Nightmares. There's a plethora of shows to check out on the Pixelated Sausage Network. And Preston, what's my favorite race car podcast? Sports Cars Unleashed, where if you're not first, you're last. Mm -hmm. All right. What do you got, buddy? Well, as always, if you need a beard, if you want a beard, if you want to grow the best Big John Wiener mustache that you can grow, check out BigDobsBeardBomb.com and use promo code PXLPARA for 20% off your order for bombs that have succulent scents such as Dundee Cedar, Sweet Tobacco, Bay Rum, Citrus, Mint, Classic. I mean, you can't go wrong with Dobbs. There you go. Uh, also check out gunslingersoap.com if you're in the Wichita area please check out our friends down at Fast Print for all your printing needs check out CD Trade Post on Pawnee and Seneca and I think that about does it I'm probably forgetting a few things but it is super late and so I will circle back to those next time around all right, y'all. Thank you so much for checking us out. I'd like to sign off by saying cheers to the weird shit in the world and those of us that love to talk about it don't get abducted And stay spooky and stay on the paranormal highway. The cast that Pixelated Paranormal would like to thank you for listening to this week's episode. Pixelated Paranormal is here to tell you tales of the fantastical, the strange, the unknown. Tales that will move you a little further down the paranormal highway. If you'd like to share your own listener story, we would love to hear it. Email us at pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. Again, that's pixelatedparanormal at gmail.com. We'd really love to hear from you. Again, thanks for listening to this week's episode of Pixelated Paranormal, your guide to the unusual and the strange.